I'm with um, Anand Patel this morning, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about erectile dysfunction. Anand's a, a doctor who specialises in men's health and uh, sexual function. Hi, Anand. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. Thanks very much for coming. So, I mean, I suppose the first question about ED is, um, how common is it? Um it's difficult to tell because we've got lots and lots of studies out there um, and all of them, as with studies, they give you slightly distant answers. But the kind of headline figures are about 40 percent at 40 years old will have some uh, maybe some intermittent erectile problems and 70 yeah. percent at 70. And yeah. if you're diabetic, it's likely to happen to you 15 years earlier. Right. So it, it's it's a big problem. Um, you know, 40 percent at 40 sounds massive, but usually that's more psychological. Yeah. Um, and, and often it's because you know, people have had kids or they're exhausted, work's really busy because there's so many different reasons why your erections might not work. It's yeah. not just about you not being turned on by your partner or by the video you're watching or the situation or whatever. It's yeah. about actually a whole host of things you know, uh, working together to either get you in the mood and keep you in the mood or cut that information off from its source and leave you feeling sort of limp. And not particularly enjoying the, the process. When you say you know forty percent at forty and seventy percent at seventy, that sounds like it's it's a disease of older men, but that's not entirely true, is it? No, not at all. I mean, there are some people who actually can be um, you know, as young people can have erectile problems, and these are called sort of primary um, erectile dysfunction, where the blood flow to the penis isn't actually adequate, um, or yeah. all the nerve supply isn't adequate to gain an erection. But they're very rare. Um, so, so, you know, we're actually talking normally about acquired, so, so you know, secondary um, erectile dysfunction, where normally people have had a period of good sexual function or good erectile performance, and then it's declined. And it's that decline, which is often intermittent, which is why people don't complain about it. Yeah. Because actually, if three out of four times it's working, well, that's okay. And then it declines to two out of four times. Well, you know, that's OK. You know, the partner doesn't mind so much. We're really busy um, and very understanding or whatever. But it does matter then if you come out of a relationship and trying to get into a new one and it doesn't work half yeah. of the time. Actually, those conversations are more difficult to have. There's a lot of embarrassment and shame around uh, erections. There's a lot of masculinity built up in the fact that you know, I am he man. I must get aroused. I must have you know a, a big erection. Um, it yeah. must be present at all times I want it, and the erection should last for as long as I want it. And all of these things, unfortunately, are, are unrealistic sexual yeah. expectations. It's absolutely normal to have you know your, 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 your soldier fall to his knees occasionally. That's absolutely fine. Um, not to have an erection, um, but if it's happening in more and more commonly, that's something we want to know about. We always hear in men's health, don't we, that men tend to present too late. So it sounds like, you know, maybe you're saying a lot of guys with ED won't come and see you until, you know, maybe it's it's not working three times out Absolutely. of four or even four times out of four. Do you think they should be coming, you know, earlier? Yes, I mean, I think it's if you've had an erection issue, so you've not been getting your erections on a regular basis um, or you know, intermittently, and that's been more than three months, for example. Yeah then that's probably worth seeing your doctor because everyone has relationship blips. Everyone has times where their mood isn't brilliant. Everyone has times when they're going through, you know, they, if you've had COVID, for example, you know, you, you know your yeah. testosterone drops, you may have erectile problems for a while after that. Uh, you know, if you, you've been sick with something, you're not going to be that interested. If you've just had a breakup, that's going to drop your interest. So you know, let yourself to have a bit of time to go back to the, your version of normal. But if yeah. it hasn't done, please absolutely come and see us. And you know, almost all GPs now are very well versed in erectile dysfunction. Um, certainly I do some teaching with the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, yeah. I'm chair of their Men's Health Day um, to try and make sure that they're as up to date as possible with it. So it's something we definitely know about. And um, you know, we take really seriously um, because there is a connection with cardiovascular risk. Um, and heart disease risk so we want to get in there as early as possible to try and manage your lifestyle and your risk factors that's what i wanted to come on to and so what are the main causes i mean i think in the past we used to always think it was purely psychological but obviously that we now know that that isn't the case yeah and, and i think psychological is a big thing I and mean, i think that kind of breaking down to four areas firstly yes psychological if you're going through them some if you're going through some stress if you're anxious if you're depressed you know, your erections are not really going to happen because, as I said, it requires blood flow and nerve function. And if your nerves aren't working because they're, I um, mean, you know, if you've got loads of stress, if you've got loads of anxiety, you're low mood, it, that part that's not going to function. And therefore, you're not going to get a good erection or you're not going to get an erection at all. 
However, also there are physical issues. Um, so, and the medical ones vary hugely. I mean, it could be the fact that your heart's low. If you imagine your penis is like a blood sponge that needs blood to be pumped into it at an adequate rate to keep inflated. So yeah. your heart's got to be pumping well, your blood vessels have to be open enough to deliver that blood, and then your penis structure has to be open enough to receive that blood. And that has to happen at the same time as your nerve supply is functioning, giving the correct information to your genitals to say, go for it, rather than shrink and there's two it's amazing we get an erection at all by the way it, it genuinely is i mean culturally you know you're told by your mum or family members not to run around with a hard on when you're one years old you know that's that's really not what you should be doing you should be playing with your willy so culturally we are you know um sensitized not to have erections in public or in, in you know in, in the wrong situation and that's via the sympathetic system so we have our sympathetic system firing at all times to just basically limit the size of our genitals and that's really important evolution because say for example you've got the saber tooth tiger having a run at you your sympathetic activates it makes your penis the size of a chicken nugget your testicles rise up towards the body so you've not got this swinging thing that can get ripped off with their next claw yeah very yeah, happy. A protective mechanism so anyone who's worried about not being a, like showing off in the showers it's because you're not supposed to yeah you know yeah. You, you, you're, if you're in a nervous situation you, it's going to get smaller but if you can activate the parasympathetic system, you have to be relatively relaxed for that. And that can be quite difficult because like, if you go on a first date, you're anxious, it's sympathetic. You know, it's going to be difficult or more difficult to get that erection. If you're relaxed, you're having a good time, um, you, know, you, you feel you know, really sort of at ease with this person, you're more likely to activate the parasympathetic. The nerves are going to fire correctly. The blood vessels are going to open. That blood vessels are going to fill full of blood. You're going to get your erection. The parasympathetic um, part of your nervous system is one exactly. we have no control yeah. over. And the, exactly. and these, these two the nervous point. systems, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you're quite right. These two nervous systems are not under your control. Yeah. And if you're in a constant state of stress because work's horrible or you, you know, your mum's got dementia or something like that, or your relationship's a problem, and that brings me you know, to my third point, you know, relationship issues are a big problem. If you're having a challenging relationship, you're in a constant state of semi like war or attack that means your sympathetic is always activated and your, your erection is not going to be really that interested. Yeah, yeah. So we've done psychological, we've um, medical, I mean, you know, cardiovascular and diabetes are your biggest causes, but also um, the medications you use to treat them. Yeah. Um, so it's really helpful to talk to your doctor if you've developed side effects of, I don't know, erectile performance after starting a blood pressure tablet, there's probably a better one you could have. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you've got specific contraindications or whatever that limits what we can do but usually there's always a better option that we can provide okay so you've got your psychological your medical um, and equally your you know, lifestyle is super important you know if you have a belly bigger than 102 centimeters you've got an increased risk of 22 cancers five times increased risk of diabetes three times increased risk of colon cancer significant increased risk of testosterone deficiency and an increased risk of erectile performance problems so, and I'm, this is certainly not fattest. As someone who has been a chubby kid and been on more diets than you could name, I know it's tough to lose weight. And I know the supermarket aisle is not organized to help you make a healthy choice. I totally get that. But if you are able to keep your waist trim, you will reduce your risk of all of these problems and likely improve your erections and improve your testosterone without having to take a medication or do anything else. Can you, and then finally, so, sorry, no, go on, go on. Yeah, and then finally, I was just going to say number four is, is, is your relationship. So you've got psychological issues, lifestyle issues, medication, sorry, medication and medical issues, so physical health problems, and then relationship issues. I just wonder if you could just say a little bit more about those physical ones, because in the four, Men's Health Forum, we particularly encourage guys to sort of take action on ED because it can yeah. be an early warning sign of heart disease and diabetes and so many, you know. I, I'm, I'm it's lovely talking to you because obviously you get it and it's great to hear those, those that phrase so if you think of as i've talked about it's blood flow into your willy yeah so those blood vessels into your willy are the narrowest and they're as so they're the narrowest part of the blood vessel tree so yeah. they're the ones that fur up first so if, say for example you've got a high cholesterol or or um, you know you've got a bigger middle the inflammation that causes damages the lining of the blood vessel and so it basically narrows yeah if you if you're trying to pump blood into a penis because you're really excited but the tube you're trying to get, get it to go through is tiny you're not going to get an erection 
If you've got a heart problem and your heart, for example, isn't working properly, it's not going to be able to pump the blood out fast enough or hard enough to get through into your penis. So things like high cholesterol, things like um, a, a greater weight, things like smoking, things like diabetes are all going to damage that blood vessel lining. So it's super important to try and look at these things and think about how can we manage that best. And, and it actually, be. it's, it's an early warning sign for heart disease. Montorsi in Italy did a study where they took something like 400 men that come in and, and presented with chest pain, um, which was a heart cause. And they mm. found that 70% of them had pre-existing erectile function problems. Yeah. And that most of those men, it was kind of three to four years, it, you know, erectile performance problems had appeared before they then developed a heart problem because your heart blood vessels are bigger. So they're yeah. going to fill up more slowly than your willy ones. So it's super important. And and how many of the you know how how common is that as a cause the that um, that kind of furring up? Of the oh, in, in most cases, it's at least part of the cause. Right, particularly okay. as you get older. I and mean, if you're forty, you're unlikely to have much furring up, but you will have started the process. But the, by the time you're seventy, it'll be much more likely to be that as the problem. So that's why the treatments vary, and why it's really helpful to speak to someone who's um, aware of men's health. To kind of go right at 40 you're more likely to have a mix of psychological relationship and uh, maybe a bit of physical health or it could be for example your mental health medication we've just put you on is having a negative impact on your erection so maybe we can change you to a antidepressant that causes less sexual problems so it's about going to someone who can be tweaking this for you yeah so um i mean you kind of mentioned it uh, alluded to it earlier where you were talking about you know not being able to get an erection when you're watching a, a video or whatever i mean what's the impact of pornography on er erections i mean we've we hear hear talk of pornography induced erectile dysfunction what's going on there well i mean you kind of wouldn't i mean you wouldn't watch james bond to learn how to drive right <laughs> so we've got all these young people watching, or all these people really in general watching porn and thinking this is teaching them about how sex should occur. And the important things are often about penile size and it, how long it should be hard for and how long sh sex should last and multiple orgasms and ejaculating outside and all of these things that don't often happen that much. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean I, I, there's a real focus on um, duration that I get from patients going, my erections don't last an hour or two. And I'm like, and? <laughs> yeah. That would be entirely normal. I don't, well, I, you know, I, yeah, I can get to orgasm at the end, but it, it waxes and wanes. You know, my erection is sometimes softer and harder and softer and harder. Like, well, that's what real life is. You know, your heart will change the speed at which it's pumping out blood, depend, and your erection will um, go up and down, depending on how good it feels, how anxious you are. So if it feels great, you'll be getting lots of feedback from your genitals to your brain going, keep going. If you, it's not feeling very good, you're going to get feedback going, oh, and that's going to then cut down that nerve information. So you're going to get this up and down, which is completely normal. The average length of sexual intercourse in the UK is 5.4 minutes from penetration to ejaculation in heterosexual couples having vaginal sex. So everyone who's trying to go, oh, no, I want to last an hour. Well, you might be able to, but make a lot of that foreplay. You know, I, I think everyone's been focusing on like dessert <laughs> when they kind of really should be pigging out on foreplay. And then actually, yes, your erection will be lasting an hour. And it will be going up and down, but it will be a lot of fun over that entire period. So the pe people we also hear talk of um, guys brains. So they, they get so used to having sex with a video, you know, watching pornography that yeah. your, your brain is literally re rewired in the way that it about what yeah, it not, I, mean, I mean is that is that a real thing i mean i don't know where i don't know if there are sort of brain imaging studies that definitively prove that but certainly yeah. the way people behave it's quite conditional so you know it because they tend to have sex with their hand on a laptop they get hard on when they open a laptop you know there's a real sort of you know pavlovian yeah. dog conditioning about it that the sexual interest gets attached to the laptop because that's yeah. when the sexual experience will happen whereas and if you're learning that at, say, 12, 13, 14, 15, yeah. that's not learning that a body, a human body, is actually where your sexual interest may lie. Now, of course, other people have other outside sexual interests like fetishes, you know, where you're attracted to objects. And I get that it's not as narrow as, as, as the human form. But if your sexual interest has always been a, 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 a video of multiple people through a laptop, in three minute segment videos mm. and the only physical experience you've had is of you often using an unlubricated hand on your penis and masturbating you know for an hour or two that doesn't re replicate sexual 
reality. Mm. And because the squeeze of a dry hand is completely different to the squeeze of a mouth or a vagina or of an anus on your penis or of someone else's hand on your penis because yeah. it feels different. Your brain is going, this doesn't feel like what it normally feels like. And so if it doesn't feel the same, it may not feel very arousing. And if it's not yeah. very arousing, you're not going to get an erection. So I do have I do have a conversation with my you know, patients who come and talk to me about erectile problems. I, you know, it's really important to kind of take a thorough history because it's not just how long have you had it for? What can we do for you? It's like, how have we got here? You know, what were the you know, what were, what were the factors that might have caused you psychologically or physically or emotionally or relationally or culturally? You know, are you really you know, are you very religious? Have you been told that you shouldn't masturbate ever? Have you told that you shouldn't have an erection, you know, shouldn't have sex, sorry, before marriage? And therefore mm-hmm. you're having this and there's so much guilt that it's firing up the synthetic again. And it's meaning you're not going to get the erection you want. Yeah. Alternatively, it could be you're a 40 year old with early onset heart disease and actually sorry, blood vessel disease. And this is how we're catching you. And so I'd really like to be picking up on you now where actually I can potentially give you medications, lifestyle advice, whatever, that will reduce your risk and improve your life expectancy. And also importantly, improve that part of your life that's in good health. Can we talk a bit, uh, and then about the treatments? I mean, presumably there's, you know, tablets and stuff, but maybe also in some cases, talking therapies and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there's loads, I, I've, I've started talking about lifestyle. I think that's super important. Yeah. If you can reduce the fat wrapped around your organs, and I appreciate you can't see that, but if, you're, if your belly circumference is over 102 centimetres, um, and it has, it's smaller in... in, in Which is um, like 40 in, inches, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, but it's smaller in Asian and um, Far East Asian men. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, I need to have a waist circumference of much less than that, which is disappointing um, but, uh, uh, because of it, uh, increased risk. So um, if you can increase that waist, dec- sorry, decrease that waist circumference, you're in a much better um, state of having a better testosterone, of reducing that inflammation in your blood vessels, um, about reducing your risk of diabetes, because diabetes is going to kill your nerve function and your um, your blood vessel function, which is why it's so potent. So that's all really helpful. Um, I mean, the other, way, the other way of looking at, you know, I, do I have a tailor's tape to measure my middle? No, I don't. Well, can you see your willy? Uh, this is your flaccid willy or your non-erect willy past your belly. If you can't, you're probably too big. Yeah. Okay? And a third of London men can't see their willies past their bellies. Right. This is a problem. Okay, and this is not meant to be, again, fat is stories. You know, it's actually just, it's a marker of health and it's, it's doing you harm. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say lifestyle is super important. So exercise is really good, particularly resistance exercise. So it, you can, look, I know people don't have lots of money, particularly these days. You can do something with a uh, body weight exercise, like press ups, mm. squats. You can put a rucksack on your back that has I know, rice, flour, books in it, whatever you've got, bricks in it, whatever you've got to hand, you can use that to then do squats. So if you're working your big chest muscles, your big buttock and thigh muscles, that's really helpful to increase your internal endogenous steroids, your endogenous testosterone, and exercise improves the blood vessel lining so it furs up less quickly. So it's all super helpful. Get yourself some good sleep because you repair in your sleep. You know, you, you end up with releasing better testosterone levels in the morning if you've slept well. Try and attend to your mental health. Don't be so stressed. I know that's easy for me to say, but what I mean by that is make sure you're looking at re- um, relaxation techniques, meditation, um, you know, speaking to someone, talking therapies if you do have anxiety or, or depression, getting medicated if that's what you need. You know, there are medications that you can use that have um, little effect on sexual performance. There are drugs such as the SSRIs that have 50% sexual side effects, you know, and 50% of people. But the important thing is... SSRIs is, used for depression, you mean? Exactly, and, and anxiety. Yeah. But please don't stop those drugs if you're on one and you're worried about it. Go and talk to your doctor about it. I've had a few cases where patients have stopped their psychological medications and gone into a mood spiral that was really damaging for their health. So mm. do go and have a talk so they can safely cross you over onto something that might be more appropriate for you. OK, it's really important not to just stop. And then finally, you kind of get to medication. I want that literally to be like the fifth thing you're thinking about, because um, a lot of people can get, you know, Vibra Connect over the, uh, you know, over the counter or they can buy Sildenafil, Tadalafil, you know, whatever drug they want. Um, we, and these are tablets that um, help your blood vessels open for longer. OK, and in doing so, that's great because that will hopefully help your erection. Um, but it only works if you're aroused. So lots mm. of people take these tablets and go, 
I was expecting a, you know, a hard on I could hang a towel on, but nothing happened. I'm like, well, did you do anything with it? Well, no, I was at work. Why would you take a Viagra at work? Anyway, that's beyond, that's beyond my understanding. <laughs> but you, know, if you have to be sexually aroused. So if you've got something attractive to look at or you're physically stimulating yourself, your erection will likely to come because mm-hmm. you need that nerve supply and you need that blood vessel supply to be activated to get the erection. Um, and things generally, things like you know, Viagra, Cialis, so um, sildenafil is the uh, generic name of Viagra, Tadalafil yeah. is the generic name, which means the, the name by which all doctors know it by, um, of, 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 of um, uh, Cialis. Um, they're both great drugs. Uh, they're both in general very safe. There are a few conditions you can't have them in, which is why it's always helpful to talk to your pharmacist, talk to your doctor if you're thinking on starting them. Because you know, if you're buying them from the internet, one, you don't know where it's coming from. So two, you don't know if it's legit. Three, you don't probably necessarily know the dose you're actually getting because yeah. they can uh, be inaccurate. Um, and four, it can be mixed with other things. Um, and be- and they, they can potentially cause you problems. And also by not seeing your doctor, you're not getting the underlying causes looked at if it is, you know, heart disease. Oh, absolutely. Or whatever. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, completely. Yeah, anyway, and I, I, I don't want to say, like, I'm not saying I want to have a monopoly on male health, right? I don't mm. think you know, not all men need to see their doctors for everything. But if you've got erection issues that have been lasting, yes, you do, because potentially you've got a heart problem until proven otherwise. Yeah. So you said you see tablets as being the fifth thing on the list. Yeah, they they are lower down, but they're not. But, you know, I think I think Viagra Connect was the second most purchased thing in a chemist or second highest by um, uh, uh, rise in in drugs after Calpol or paracetamol that you give your kid. Right. Yeah. So loads of people we know are getting Viagra without having a discussion with their doctor. My concern is how many of them are going to have early heart disease we're not picking up on. Yeah. And I absolutely appreciate our pharmacist, um, you know, clinician colleagues are doing their very best. They've got like a questionnaire they've got to ask, et cetera. But that doesn't get to the, the root of all things. It doesn't check your cholesterol. It doesn't check your um, you know, HbA1c, which measures your blood glucose. It doesn't check necessarily your blood pressure. It doesn't do an ECG, a reading of your heart, to see if there's an electrical activity problem of your heart. Mm. It doesn't examine your prostate. So there are bits of your examination that might be really helpful mm. in, in working out, is there a physical cause um, or is it just very low risk and it's likely psychological because you're going through a really difficult time of work. So if, if tablets are fifth, what are the four things we should do first? So lifestyle, exercise, sleep, sorting your mental health, and then okay. I get to medication. And then, and then come on to medication. Yeah, sorry, I've broken lifestyle. lifestyle I mean, lifestyle. Yeah, I'm, no, that, that's that's great, Anand, thanks. Um, and, and there's a lot of talk as well now at the moment about testosterone, particularly for older men. A lot of, I mean, you know, I'm obviously in that category now myself, and people are often say, you know, talking about testosterone as being a, as being an issue and that we we have lower levels than we than perhaps we should have how, how much of a role is is testosterone playing here so four in ten men over 45 will have a low testosterone but only one in ten men will have a low testosterone and the symptoms and that's how you diagnose testosterone deficiency syndrome it's both having symptoms and having uh, the low testosterone we know testosterone is really important at long-term heart health um, reducing your risk of diabetes uh, muscle strength but also brain function you know how, how you're thinking so often people describe a sense of brain fog or you know, or, or they lose their mojo they feel like someone's turned down the color in the world yeah so they often get treated for, for, um, with antidepressants actually initially because they're a bit more anxious they're irritable um they're they're feeling more tired and and, and understandably because one third of all gb consultations are about mood it gets it gets put in that category first um however more and more people know now that actually it can be due to a low testosterone particularly in our older age group and if you have a low testosterone and you have diabetes or if you have a low testosterone and you have cardiovascular disease you're likely to live less long yeah. So that's and to be very clear, that's if you've got a low testosterone compared to normal. I'm not talking at all about high testosterone. We do not ever give testosterone therapy medication so that you would have a higher than the normal range testosterone yeah. because there are then other heart risks, blood vessel risks, um, blood count risks that you can develop as a result of that. So it's really we're trying to um, focus you within a quite sort of narrow bandwidth, which is what your body's trying to do anyway. Yeah. So how many men have, you know, in at the age of 50 or whatever, have got this p- particularly low level of testosterone that needs treatment? So one in one in 10. 
one in ten. So one in 10, which is quite a lot of people, right? Yeah, still a I lot of people. It's not like menopausal women where it's it's virtually all of them. It, yeah. it, and I appreciate it, it's not all of them for reasons, but equally in men, it's not all of them at all. And that's why I don't talk about the andropause. Yeah, because it's kind of like stealing a uh, stealing a, a phrase uh, from women, and it, 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 it does, it's not quite the same thing. But yeah, one in ten men or you know people with male characteristics will have both the symptoms mm. and the uh, low testosterone levels, and that's really important to get checked out. Some of them will have lower levels of testosterone, but they won't have any symptoms. Maybe that's because that's been the level that they've had their their entire life. It's normal. Maybe, or, but the, the issue is people are so variable. Yeah. And the way that our bodies respond to hormones are really variable. So for, for that person who's got a low testosterone, but is still able to get an erection, still feels they can think at work, is really motivated, isn't grumpy, has a good mood, good relationship. Fine. You don't need to go. And why would you medicate someone like that? Mm-hmm. Um, but, for example, if they are struggling at work and often we get people who've gone, you know, they've had a performance review at work because they don't seem to be thinking or motivated as they used to be or they're having struggles with their partner, et cetera. And you kind of go, actually, some of this may be related to your testosterone. And we know that erections work better on a background of healthy testosterone humming around your body. Mm. So testosterone itself is not going to turn you into this like King Dong um, erectile sex guru. It will, however, keep the engine running so you're more open to sexual cues when they come in and you're more able to respond to them. It's going to help you feel more alert and bright if they've previously been low. Okay, we're not trying to medicate the world here and I can't promise it as this panacea for everything. It doesn't cure everything. I think that's really helpful if you make that point now, Anna, because I do think there's, you know, there's been a bit of, it's been quite a lot of hype around testosterone because we've, you know, we've, we've maybe discovered things about it recently we didn't really know before, and yeah. suddenly everyone thinks it's going to do the, some of the things that you say, and, and it doesn't work like that. And I'm really, really sorry for young people who are often influenced by TV shows or influenced by social media, and they're wanting this bigger sculpted body, so bigger muscles, yeah. Yeah. and and they are then putting themselves on anabolic steroids, which they're sourcing from the grey market, which is a nice way of saying they're gym buddy, uh, yeah. or online, and they're injecting themselves often with like to levels of, you know, 50 times higher than would ever normally be achieved. And when they come in, like they're 20, and we see them, they're, they're, they, they come, sometimes they come off them and they just feel like a ghost. Yeah. And then if I try and give you back you know, your testosterone level to what the top end of what normal would be for a, you know, for a young, healthy, you know, virile young man, they still feel like a ghost because it's nothing compared to the hundred times level they'd previously achieved. And some of them will have developed infertility as a result of those excess steroids that they've been using. Their testicles may have shrunk. And you know, these are changes that, that you may not recover. And I'm not, certainly not saying that's the experience for everyone. That isn't. But it really is clear that more and more people who are using hair products to try and retain their hair or tablets to try and keep their hair are going to end up with longer term, you know, lower sperm counts. I mean, I'm doing it calling a TV show on fertility at the moment. And it's becoming really clear. There are so many environmental factors that are important in our testosterone and therefore secondarily our fertility. Um, So taking all this stuff externally, unless it's needed medically, I think is seriously problematic. And I think that's mostly being driven by media. Mm. I, I can see that you, like me, have never bothered with any of the, the hair restoration. Problem. Well, my, my testosterone kicked in at 13 at puberty, unfortunately. And because I'm so sensitive to one of the breakdown products, DHT, it's miniaturized my hair follicles. I, I have to be honest, like 16, 17 and a bald patch was not cool. And, no. and, that, and you know, it, it wasn't ideal then. But you know, it, I've never had to pay for a haircut. It's delightful. <laughs> I can wash the other, it. The other like thing you. there, I guess maybe we should we should address then is that some people think that you know baldness and and, and prostate problems and all this are a result of excess testosterone. But it's not that, is it? It's it's the way your body reacts to not to a normal amount Absolutely. of testosterone. So it's my testosterone. DHT. Exactly. Perfect. My testosterone is broken down into DHT and hair follicles that on your scalp are particularly sensitive to DHT. And unfortunately, some people's scalps, when you do expose them to DHT, the hair follicles get smaller uh, and, and the hair starts to fall out. And then they become you, know, you can often see like fine, fine little almost sort of um, baby hair 
uh, uh, there, but then they fall out completely. Um, mm. And it's nothing to do with your prostate. <laughs> and it's nothing to do, it's just how, how sensitive you are to DHT. And there are some men who have beautiful manes of hair for all of their lives um, and others that won't. And that's, that's another feature. What The reason that my patients are often most unlikely to start testosterone is because of the risk to their hair. Mm. I get more concerns about that than even fertility. So if, if, you know, if your hair is really, really important to you, then that is a question because yeah. when you've got low testosterone, your hair stops falling out because you've got a low testosterone. Mm. Well, if you get given it back, the hair falling out process may start again. And we know that like, yeah, even at 25, a significant proportion of our patients have already lost some of their hair. Yeah. By the time you get to 80, it's 80% of people have lost you know, some or all of their hair. Mm. So it's going to happen to you, but with testosterone, it may happen sooner. Mm. So we talked a little bit about some of these new things that are happening in, in, in terms of ED, you know, the influence of Paul, maybe the role of testosterone. Yeah. What, what else is going on? You know, so there's the loads moment, beyond the tablet. What sort of things you see in which may be different from what you were seeing, you know, 20 years ago? Well, there are loads of treatments beyond the tablets. I mean, 20 yeah. years ago is a good, a, good, a good thought because 20 years ago, these drugs were in their infancy relatively. Mm. Yeah. Um, and people were still having to use things like penile constrictor rings or cop rings, yeah. as they're otherwise known, um, or a vacuum pump devices. And Austin Powers used to be very sort of uh, you know, judgmental about them, see how embarrassing it was. But actually, they were a big deal. And they yeah. did work to draw blood into the penis. And then you'd use the penile constrictor ring to contract on the base to hold yeah. the blood in there. And they still can be very useful in people who can't have drugs like Viagra or Cialis. Yeah. So they're super important. So that's coming back again. And we certainly have lots, some of our prostate patients who may have had a um, prostate cancer removed, having their penis exercised using mm. the, the vacuum pump device and these tablets to try and get the blood flow going again. Yeah. Um, but equally, we're, we're moving on now um, to things like prostaglandin creams, where you can either apply a cream to the head of the willy or, in, or sort of inject a pellet into the, the hole at the end of, of the willy. And that releases some prostaglandin, it's a chemical that causes um, the blood vessels to open up and, and, and the, the penis to get an erection. Uh, so that's, that's now available and out there and, and lots of people get on with that very well. Um, injectables. Um, so lots of those people on uh, in porn films that you're amazed that their erections are lasting uh, many hours often have had an injection into their penis, again, of a prostaglandin. Mm -hmm. um, they inject sort of uh, this, um, uh, they have a syringe and a needle, they inject this chemical into their penis and basically it sort of forces an erection. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, you've even got penile implants. Um, so this is very, very, you know, it's very uncommon. Um, it's maybe sort of uh, one to five percent of men with um, erectile problems, which is so severe. The tablets and uh, the constrictor rings and all of that doesn't work. Uh, then then an, an penile implant can be inserted. And that has a you know, huge um, positivity rate. Um, you know, people are really, really uh, positive about it, but it does come with significant risks because you're putting two plastic tubes down the length of your willy, replacing where the erectile material is and putting structures near the bladder and between your testicles. So it's a three part organizational structure um, and that comes with its own risk. So you've got to really want it, um, but it is very effective if you need it. Mm. The new kid on the block, though, is kind of shockwave therapy, um, where people have been looking at uh, shockwaves that people use, to, like so ultrasound probe that they use to shock um, uh, kidney stones. Yeah. Um, and they've been using them on uh, people who've got tendonitis, so in their joints. So if they've got um, funny elbow problems, so like you know, tennis elbow, or if they've got Achilles tendonitis, you can use shockwave therapy to reduce inflammation and develop new blood vessels. Right. And they thought, well... If the problem is blood vessel flow, can we do that to the penis to encourage new blood vessels to form? And they found that actually there are some studies that show it does work very well. And the effects can last for several years, but you may need to have several courses. And the problem that most people have had is it can be quite expensive. Right. It's only, you know, some places charge up to four grand for a course. So it's not- Why is it so expensive if you're just using an existing technology? It, well, quite. 
<laughs> well, have, obviously, but obviously, yeah, people sell the attachments and it becomes a big thing, right? Um, because everyone wants the latest machine and they want you know, this. This has been proven because this gives you a level of 7,000 uh, hertz. So there's all that thing about do numbers matter? And so there's mm. lots of trials going on at the moment. It's actually, well, what's the minimum you can get away with? What's the number you need to do? What machine can you use to get it working? So that's do you think the, we that's might the, see that on the NHS? Because it sounds to me that if you, if you do something like that, you intervene and it works for several years years that's got to be better than keep prescribing tablets or whatever so it's, it's usually used as an adjunct so that's alongside other things i mean the uh -huh. two honest, the tablets are are very cheap so they're often yeah. the first thing that go to but but you know cochrane's vacuum pump devices again you know can be a hundred pounds for the vacuum pump devices 200 pounds for the for the more expensive ones so again not necessarily so cheap but lots of people can get them on the nhs it's mm. only available, however, to people with specific conditions like prostate cancer, diabetes, etc. It's not available to everyone. And would you uh, like to see say, that change, Anand? Would you like to see that change? Because yes, absolutely. I mean, I you know, the prescription charge thing and the restrictions in some cases are not very helpful. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think that if someone has a likely blood vessel problem that's causing their um, uh, reduction in blood flow, then they should hopefully have access to the treatments. Yeah. Also, I get the fact that, you know, we have been underfunded for 12 years and the NHS runs on a system where it kind of does population care. Mm. You know, and if, 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 for example, it's going to cost, you know, on the NHS, maybe a grand to, to treat you for your, um, uh, for your shockwave therapy compared to four grand in, in the private sector. But that grand could pay for a thousand people's um, high, you know, blood pressure treatment. It, you know, it becomes a conversation of what do I want to pay for? Do I want do we want to pay for your erection? You know, what do we want to fund? And mm. so you, know, you can have that argument with you know, obesity, with smoking cessation, with alcohol, alcoholism. Um, but it really is a discussion. You know, it still upsets me or frustrates me that there's no guidelines from NICE about teach about um, treating testosterone deficiency. Mm. They just because what happens if you've got a load of people you now need to stick on testosterone? It costs more money. Yeah. This sounds like a sort of bit of a classic men's health issue that the whole thing, it seemed like men getting erections is basically a, a leisure activity. It's basically, it. you know, because we we want to do it and it's not import, an important part of our lives. But because of the physical and the mental benefits of it, it's a massive part of our lives. Um, I couldn't, I mean, you know, perfect. I mean, I couldn't agree more. It is, it is, you know, and there's also a restriction on the number of tablets you can have because they yeah. didn't average where they took like the average 50 year old, you know, how often should they be having sex? So you're only allowed one Viagra per week. Yeah. And you're thinking, what? But what if, so, you know, what if someone's 25 and they've got blood vessel issues or you know, they've got neurological issues, you know, and you can give more for psychological distress and there is a bit more freedom around um, the generic versions of the tablets. But we still come up against people going, you shouldn't be doing that. And you're going, but we, we know it improves health. Yeah, but yeah. Um, the restrictions say this. There's a kind of moral aspect to all that, isn't there? Oh, yeah, you're only supposed to have sex once a week. Yeah, but also, you know, why, why, you know, uh, we don't want to, we don't want a bunch of horny 70 year olds mm. running around, like imagining them like a bunch of old goats. I mean, it's really offensive. It's thinking, well, why shouldn't a 70 year old man, woman, whoever have a healthy sex life mm. if they want that? And it's going to make them healthier in so many other ways. You're not, you're not going to be fighting, you know, depression, mental health problems, dementia, all those sorts of things. And, and sex is exercise. Yeah. And sex is exercise. You know, it, it's, it's about the same. You know, having a sort of uh, mid-level sex with, 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 a, with your average orgasm is the same intensity as doing some gardening. Yeah, yeah. And if you can't be bothered to go outside at the moment, which I can completely understand because it's freezing, <laughs> then you know, a bit of sex might be exactly what you want for your afternoon absolutely so thanks very much for your time and i'd really appreciate you just to finish off then i mean what is your advice to a guy who is beginning to notice that maybe you know because we're not telling guys to go to the clinic the first time they can't get an erection because that's absolutely normal but at what point do you kind of think okay this is becoming a bit more often than than it should be and maybe i need to sort of do something about it so if you've got an erection problem that bothers you, because I'm not going to define the number of times it fails right. or whatever, but if you've got an erection problem that bothers you and causes distress, and you've had a look at you know, your sleep, your environment, your lifestyle, you know, you've, you've attended to the things that might be causing those external causes, and that hasn't really helped, come and see us. Yeah. You know, if the problem's lasted over three months, 
Um, you know, I, 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 that's an arbitrary time. You know, if it's really upsetting, you know, come at one month, you know, that's fine. Um, because it's happened all of a sudden and it's stopped dead. I definitely want to see you. You know, uh, so it's, it's difficult. To, let me just phrase that better. I'm trying to think of, um, if you have an erection problem that is bothering you, come and see me. I yeah. may tell you that's fine and normal. So I may tell you it's normal. It's not fine for you, obviously, but I may tell you it's normal. And that that's an expectation within the boundary of normality. Um, but I will still try and help you with the lifestyle stuff. If, yeah. however, it does sound like there might be an issue there, I will do the blood tests. I will do the investigations and we will see what we can do to get you going, whether that's referral to a psychosexual therapist, whether that's you know getting a bit more of that weight around your middle off whether it's eating the right sort of diet whether it's sleeping better or whether it's tablets injectables or even an implant and most guys can have a reasonable expectation to get that from any gp yeah i mean they probably won't get an implant from a gp no. um, and they said well, and injectables are unlikely to get from it from a gp but we know people will refer you to you'll be sent to the urologist or andrologist or local men's health specialist who will be able to help that but the but the the, the, yeah, the basic stage is Absolutely, any GP should be able to support it. But what I would suggest you do is look on the website page of your GP and find who specialises in men's health. Yeah. Because if you can find that person who specialises in men's health, they're more likely going to be able to give you the care that you need. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Anand. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for your time. <laughs>